Okay, I guess that's our cue to get started, huh? Uh, without me knocking on the gap, my gavel, so to speak. Uh, so good evening, I'm, I'm Lance Freeman. Uh, I'm the director of the Urban Planning Program and an associate professor here in urban planning. Uh, welcome to Midtown Redux. It's uh, one of a series of lectures this year um, on the theme of, the theme tonight is a conductor. Uh, so at the end of tonight's session, uh, we'll give you a little quiz to see if you can make the connection between the presentation and the theme of uh, conductor. Uh, we have a distinguished panel of guests this evening uh, who are going to give, some, give us some food for thought on a major initiative in Midtown Manhattan, uh, the rezoning of Midtown East. In some ways, it, it represents sort of a classic confrontation between different visions of the city, um, the growing, uh, dynamic, uh, business-friendly city that many claim is what makes New York great versus a vision of New York that preserves its rich heritage and while is willing to accompany business interests, does not see the city merely as a, as, as a vessel for profit accumulation. Um, so that's sort of an exaggerated um, dichotomy to be sure, but um, if you've read some of the uh, newspaper columns, um, some of the editorials around this issue, you can see those two competing themes uh, sort of, uh, well, competing for our, our allegiance. And so what we hope to do this evening is to uh, spark some debate and some uh, important thinking about this rezoning. Um, in many ways, obviously, the rezoning is what's on the table, but the issues at hand are part of a larger discussion about the type of city that we think that we want to have. And, it, and it's applicable not only to New York, but to other dynamic, other older cities as well. How do we balance the competing interests of accommodating growth and development versus preserving our heritage, which is also part of what makes, uh, not only preserving our heritage, but the livability of New York. That's also part, I think, of what makes New York City a great place. So it's those co two competing interests that are, in my view, a part of a, the heart of some of the debates about the rezoning of mid uh, the Midtown Manhattan. I'm just gonna briefly uh, read out uh, the panel that we have. Uh, we have Lisanne Couture, who's a professor of practice here at GSAP. She's a partner in uh, Asymptote Architecture. She's won numerous awards. Uh, she's had uh, academic appointments at Yale University, at the University of Michigan, uh, at the Parsons School of Design. Uh, she's been at the New York Found uh, Arts Fellow at the New York Foundation. And she's a New York registered architect and a member of the American Institute of Architects. Uh, we also have Andrew Dolkart, who's the director of the Historic Preservation Program and the James Marston Fitch Associate Pro Professor of Historic Preservation. He's a graduate of Colgate University and Columbia's uh, Historic Preservation uh, Program. He recently published the book, The Row House Reborn, Architecture and Neighborhoods in New York, as well as New York City, New York Vernacular City, Expanding the Canon of New York City Architecture. Uh, we also have David Andrew King, who's an assistant professor of urban planning. He explores the impact of local transportation planning on the environment, public finance, and accessibility. He's written a number of articles looking at the impact of parking on planning. Uh, he also will share his thoughts with us on the rezoning. Uh, we have Kate Asher, who, um, unbeknownst to her, has been designated as a representative of the city's position <laughs> on the Midtown rezoning. She's the Mills Dean Professor of Urban Development as well as a principal, a principal at Happel Consulting here in New York. She, uh, her public sector work is involved in the overseeing of major infrastructure and master planning projects in the New York City metropolitan area, including development of waste, telecommunications, um, and environmental business, working with environmental business and other advocacy groups as well. She uh, recently published a really, um, a really great book on skyscrapers. It's a really uh, informative and entertaining book as well as a, a great piece of scholarship as well. 
And finally, we have uh, Michael Kimmelman, who is uh, an author, a critic, an architecture critic for the New York Times. Um, recent books include The Accidental Masterpiece as Portraits as well. And he's also going to share with us some of his opinions about and react to some of the other presenters uh, regarding this rezoning proposal. So um, the game plan for this evening will have each of the presenters speak briefly on the topic, um, but we really would like to have more of a conversation and also to invite you in the audience to get involved as well. So the presenters will speak briefly. Um, we'll have some dialogue amongst our, the presenters themselves, and then we'll open it up to discussion as well. Okay? So without further ado, we'll start. Um, I'm going to let uh, David King make the first presentation. Okay. Well, welcome, and uh, thank you for coming. This is a... Um, it's a controversial issue, which is right in the uh, sort of right in the wheelhouse of planning, and that this is what we do as planners: is we deal with controversial issues. Um, and we like to think that we have something to contribute to help uh, to help make um, the city a better place and to help it grow. Now, I want to focus my comments a bit on some general issues associated with um, this type of development in uh, in an already dense area talk about some of the limits to transportation and the opportunities for transportation and some of the uh, challenges to the way uh, these projects are financed. Um, and one of the key things to, to think about, and this is, this is an issue that comes up not just with the Midtown East rezoning, but also with some of the um, discussion that's, uh, that's popped up around Penn Station and even with the Seven Line extension, is, is this issue of value capture and capturing some of the value from redevelopment to pay for uh, specific types of projects. This is a, um, a, a, an economically efficient, but potentially uh, problematic way of financing services. And it, uh, it's economically efficient in that it, it, the value of the, of, of the property is often associated with the value of the infrastructure. So it makes sense to take, capture some of the value from the infrastructure to spend it, or from the value of the property to spend it on the infrastructure. But in many cases, what we're starting to see around the country is that the value capture mechanisms themselves are being captured by people who will use the money to spend on their pet projects. Now, I'm not saying that this is the case within the Midtown East rezoning, but if we're gonna capture a lot of value from development in New York, the money that's spent on public infrastructure should be, should meet public goals. And this is something that we need to consider carefully, both within the Midtown East rezoning and other Midtown, and other rezonings throughout the city. And if value capture is a good mechanism, are these types of mechanisms going to be available for other types of rezonings elsewhere in the city? And one of the things to consider and this has been brought up in some of the critiques of, uh, of the rezoning, is what, what's the future of employment? What's the future of the spatial structure of the city? How does the transit network affect where firms will choose to locate? And we know that our relationship with work is changing. We know that firms' relationships with cities are changing. Firms are no longer locating all of their, uh, all of their production within, uh, within central cities. Firms are fragmenting. And perhaps if we really have some uh, value that's available to capture in Midtown, in elsewhere in Manhattan, it might be that some of that um, should be some of the revenue should be spent to improve opportunities elsewhere in the city. That it may not be in the best interest of the city to focus it all in one location. But one of the most compelling critiques of the Midtown East rezoning is that the transit network is already full. And the transit network is full, in which case we shouldn't build anything else there. Now this is a controversial and, uh, uh, point of view in that it's not fully supported. It makes sense if we hold all else equal that if we add more people who need to get in and out of Midtown, it will add to the burden of the system as it is. 
But one of the ways, but uh, let me back up for a second, but we're not sure that that's gonna happen. People are very adaptable when it comes to transportation. Firms are adaptable when it comes to transportation. And transportation limitations also become a self-correcting mechanism within, um, within urban development. If there's no additional capacity, it's unlikely that developers will realize the benefits of additional, of, of higher values for their land. But also, um, more broadly, as we think about development throughout the city, is transportation, especially passenger transportation, personal transportation, which is what we're concerned about here, does it act like a liquid or does it act like a gas? Right? And if transportation, if personal transportation acts like a liquid, then the volume stays the same wherever it's diverted. And that's the way people are thinking about the transportation issues associated with the Midtown East rezoning. But transportation can act like a gas, where it expands and, contra and contracts to meet the existing infrastructure. We saw this with the Atlantic Yards project. The Atlantic Yards project, there's a lot of people really up in arms because uh, the Barclays Center was not building enough parking. They were convinced that they were not building enough parking. They only built 1,000 spaces or, or thereabouts. And I told lots of, lots of reporters were calling me, wanting me to talk about how awful that was gonna be. And I said, we just don't know what's gonna happen. There's a lot of transit there. There's a lot of additional capacity. And it turns out that that's largely what happened. But as, when we talk about transit capacity, which is, is one other thing and part of how we might adapt the system, the solution to all our transit woes are not necessarily new capital investment. There's a lot of service improvements that we can make. There's a lot of operational improvements that we can make. And I'm not saying I, I have not analyzed the Midtown East in this, in this way, so I don't know what capacity is, is untapped there. But certainly, the way we treat transit in the United States is we tend to view it as a capital investment process rather than thinking about how we can improve services that are already existing, improve headways, get, uh, improve our train signals, get more capacity in and out of Grand Central. Grand Central is not performing as well as similarly sized station or uh, terminals elsewhere in the world. So it's not obvious that the Midtown East rezoning, if it were built out, will result in a traffic problem. It may, it may, it might, it might not, but it's not obvious that it, that it will. So with uh, those few um, caveats of how to potentially think about this, I will uh, pass it on to the next speaker. <laughs> Okay, thanks David. Uh, I think David gave us some food for thought for considering how the new um, rezoning might or might not impact um, trans the transportation infrastructure. Uh, I'd be curious to see you know, how going forward we can try to tease out whether or not transportation will act like a gas or a liquid uh, as we go forward. Um, Okay, so next, why don't we have Andrew Dokart come up. He's gonna share with us his um, views of the proposed rezoning. Well, I prepared a sort of formal presentation, so I have some images. I'm, I'm here today, partly I surmise, because I'm the director of the Historic Preservation Program, and preservation advocates have been among the most critical of the Midtown East proposal, but also I'm an historian whose work investigates issues around the architecture and development of New York with special interest in the forms created by the city's speculative builders. So as a preservationist, I have to say I'm not opposed to new development. I think that a lot of the... I think that a lot of the publicity about Midtown East has set up a simplistic dichotomy. Either we rezone Midtown in the manner that is proposed by the Bloomberg administration, leading the advocates to claim that this and only this will create a dynamic city of the future, or we designate buildings as landmarks, thus resulting, they would argue, in a stagnating city. But this is a completely false dichotomy, I think. No one, not even the most vocal preservation advocates, are against development in Midtown. But many of us are convinced that the present proposal will not result in a livable city that continues to have the attributes that make New York so dynamic and such a unique place for business and residents. The present plan lacks any consideration of just the things that make New York so desirable. 
Preservationists want to preserve that which is worthwhile from the architecture of past generations so that it will be an important feature of New York in the future. And we also want to further new quality architecture, that is the landmarks of the future. So first off, something that all critics have commented upon with this rezoning proposal, what's the rush? If this plan is so wonderful, why do we need to rush it through under the present administration? We all know the reason for this, of course. The mayor wants to leave this as a legacy, and it is a gift to his supporters within the development community. But this is a proposal that will have serious repercussions in the future, and we need to be able to discuss and debate whether it is the course that we want to see for the future of New York. The proposal is all about density, and I have to say, when I first saw this, I was in a room full of people who were aghast when they saw this, and we thought that it had been prepared by people who were opposed to the rezoning, uh, and only to find out that it's actually a design in favor of the, the rezoning. But I find this quite horrifying. <laughs> Most of us who live in New York love the density. It's one of the characteristics that makes New York a great city. So I think we can all agree that a dense city is a vibrant city and a sustainable city, but just how dense a city do we want it to be? We have relatively small and shallow blocks and narrow streets. So what's the height that works best? I don't have the answer to this question, but I don't trust the real estate board to make the decision for us. The proponents of this rezoning argue that New York is, fail, is falling behind other world cities like London and Shanghai because of the lack of new construction in Midtown East and that the buildings in the area are old, obsolete, and shabby. This seems awfully simplistic to me. If Midtown East is so filled with obsolete and shabby buildings, why are rents in these buildings among the highest in New York? And why is space on Park Avenue and nearby streets so sought after? And while there has not been a great deal of new construction on Park Avenue, new office buildings have engulfed Times Square, are rising on the World Trade Center site, and are planned for the Hudson Yards, and indeed have gone up in Midtown East as well. Yes, some buildings in Midtown East are obsolete in their present form, but not all of them. In a number of cases, as owners have realized that they have that they have, they, as, as owners have realized that their buildings are aging, they have invested in upgrades that include new systems and even new facades. And both of these are recent, uh, recently upgraded post-war buildings with new facades. Responsible owners have kept their buildings in peak condition. If systems are obsolete and if a building is looking shabby, who is to blame for this? There are certainly developable sites in Midtown East, but these can be re redeveloped now with buildings of substantial scale. Many of us have come to understand that the most dynamic urban places are those that combine the old and the new. This is what makes Midtown East and other New York neighborhoods so interesting. In Midtown East, you have the juxtaposition of older buildings, of early, of early townhouses, great buildings from the 1920s, including hotels and office buildings. This is the Hotel Lexington. Post-war office buildings, this one's on Park Avenue. And very recent buildings, the one on the far right is on, on the... Um, the southwest corner of uh, 42nd Street and Madison Avenue, and is about two years old. This is a really exciting juxtaposition of structures, large and small, old and new, brick and stone, glass and metal. This is why people want to be in New York, for the exciting diversity of buildings, of uses, and of people. This diversity is why people want to be out on the streets of New York, while they do not want to spend time outside in the office district of Shanghai or in London's antiseptic Cannery Wharf. Advocates for the rezoning have completely dismissed any notion that preservation should be a part of any rezoning of the area and that there might be landmark eligible buildings in the district. Indeed, a report on historic buildings in Midtown East prepared by Midtown 21st Century, a group advocating for this zoning change, could not find even one landmark worthy building in the proposed zoning district. Not even one. So how seriously are we to take this report? Several local preservation organizations have put out lists of potential landmarks in Midtown East. The most comprehensive of these was undertaken by the Historic Districts Council, and just for honesty, I was part of that survey. The lists formulated for va by various groups are not the same. People disagree as to what is worthy of designation, but at least they have started a discussion, something that the zoning proposal does not do. There are significant buildings that have not been designated. This is the Erdman House, which is now the Friars Club, one of the great townhouses from the early 20th century development in the area. This is the Gray Bar Building, one of the great post-World uh, post War I uh, office buildings that reflects on the 1916 zoning law and has spectacular ornament, including on the left these 
Roman togged men holding 1920s telephones and trucks, and on the right, rats running up the, the, uh, the struts. On this, the Shelton Hotel, probably one of the two or three most important buildings in New York that is not a designated landmark, a key building in the history of the response to the 1916 zoning, and the Union Carbide Building, generally uh, thought of as one of the great post-war uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill buildings uh, designed by Natalie Dubois. It is also important to note that major redevelopment and modernization are occurring in the area even without the rezoning. The area has not stagnated. Just recently it was announced that one of the post-war office buildings on Park Avenue would be replaced by an enormous tower by Norman Foster and they didn't have to wait for the rezoning. Where is the planning on the city's part to set the stage for rezoning of the district that will result in substantial new construction and an increase in office population? One of the criticisms that many people have of planning under the Bloomberg administration is that proposals are made without any advanced preparation in areas that will be impacted. We have relied too much on the possibility of some improvements later after a project is completed due to funds generated by a project rather than these improvements required before the project begins. It's a sort of trickle-down theory of, of development. This is one of the major and I think most legitimate criticisms of the Midtown zoning proposal. No infrastructure work is proposed before the massive towers are built. Perhaps there will be some trickle-down money to pay for transit improvements after the fact. Sure, as Ken Jackson has noted, there are fewer subway riders today than there were in the 1940s, but how many of us want to return to this kind of a scene on the subway? It's one of my favorite Reginald Marsh paintings. And don't count on the 2nd Avenue subway for much relief since the present construction phase will not come down into Midtown, but only comes down as far south as 63rd Street. So let's really sit down and plan for the future of Midtown East. Sure, density is a great thing and one of the things that makes New York so dynamic, but what does that mean? Just how tall do we want our buildings to be? New York has never been afraid of height, nor are we today but what are the heights and densities that our relatively small blocks and our transit system and other infrastructure can handle? We don't really know the answers to these questions. We need to carefully study the issues to create a truly sustainable plan, not one that just says, well, let's build giant skyscrapers so that we can be the new Shanghai. We want a livable and sustainable city with tall office buildings and with smaller historic buildings as well. A new Midtown East that conforms with the character of New York as a dynamic and ever-changing city that also respects its heritage. A Midtown East that is about creating a new New York City and not creating a Manhattan version of the banal office centers of other cities. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think uh, Andrew has kind of laid down the gauntlet, so to speak, from the perspective of preservationists. Um, Next, we're going to have Kate Asher come up and uh, give her comments. On... Um, okay. okay. <laughs> um, uh, I think most of what I'll contribute this evening will be by way of response to some of the discussions, but just so everybody understands what's, what's going on here. And I was, have not been involved in the development of this proposal um, at all. So I know broadly what it's aiming to do and why, and I understand the mechanism. But as most of you know, the idea here is to attempt to encourage some newer um, commercial space in an area of Midtown that has historically been the most important commercial center. And that's an effort to compete with cities. We've talked about Shanghai, we've talked about London. Um, in, in that global marketplace for those types of corporations. And those of you, I've just spent a year in London, those of you who've um, been to London recently know that what's happening in London is not just happening out in sanitized Canary Wharf, it's happening in the older areas of the city of London as well. Many of the new and many of the most sort of respected um, from an architectural standpoint, buildings are going up in places like London Bridge, they're going up in the city of London, they're going up in the older areas side by side with very historic buildings, and in some cases taking down buildings that were there and replacing them with more modern buildings. And they are proving very, very successful. It's a new public realm, it's not the old public realm, literally next to places like Tower Bridge, London Bridge, places that are as, hist as historic as it gets more historic in, in, in century terms than, than our places. So the whole idea is to be able to encourage some new commercial development in a place that wants to retain its space in, in the global economy. Um, along with that, there's a sense that um, there's a series of public realm improvements that need to be made 
some of which are underground, many of which are underground, some of which are above ground. And for reasons that we're not going to go into here, there is no money to pay for that. Historically, much of that money would have been paid for by a transit agency. Much of what is happening in London to accommodate the kind of growth that's happening in London is, is happening because they are able to invest in their transit system. Their transit system is run by the city. For reasons that have nothing to do with this administration, um, the transit system here is, is poorly funded. It's run by the state, and it is always attempting to find new ways to finance um, its rolling stock, its signaling systems. It really does not have the capability to do what arguably it should have done a long time ago on the east side, which is to provide additional capacity, both on the, on the overland rail side in terms of um, Metro North and also in terms of the 4, 5, and 6 subway system. So really understanding that what this proposal is aiming to do is to not necessarily provide a stopgap measure, but address problems um, that on, a, on a small scale. And I say a small scale because although the rezoning is 73 blocks, the sense that all of a sudden these tall buildings are going to mushroom up is just not what's going to happen. Rezoning is a very blunt tool. And I could be wrong, but I think there's about maybe 18 or 19 sites in total that would qualify for the kind of um, treatment that would allow money to go into, into this fund that would finance the public realm improvements. I, my guess is they'll be lucky if half of those sites get developed or redeveloped over the next 10 to 20 years. So um, that's the sort of goal of the, of the program and, and this sort of specter of all these really tall buildings all of a sudden going up is just not the way the world of real estate works. We know that there's other real estate going up in lower Manhattan. We know there's real estate going up on the far west side. These buildings will come when the market is ready for them and they will not come before. And hopefully the infrastructure system will be ready for them. Um, there's other um, information that perhaps you are or are not aware of. So there's been also this idea that the buildings are going to come and the infrastructure won't be there to accommodate them. There apparently is work underway to ensure, like on the far west side, that the infrastructure is there before the buildings come, and that's a question of financing and financial mechanisms. Remember, this city has been very good at figuring out new mechanisms to finance transit improvements associated with development. They have subway bonuses that go to developers who are fixing the subway stations down below. They have the Hudson Yards mechanism, which paid for the infrastructure before the buildings came, but is being paid back by the buildings themselves. So there's lots of ways to address that, so we have to assume that um, our city planners are not stupid and understand that that infrastructure will be absolutely critical to getting those buildings there. Without it, those buildings won't rise. So that's really all I, I want to say. I don't want to go into the landmark buildings and the issues with those, but I'm happy to pick those up in questioning afterwards. And our next presenter will be uh, Lisa Couture. Okay, um, well, I just wanted to pick up on something that Kate uh, kind of emphasized, and, and that is that there won't be a whole rash of tall, uh, overscaled buildings populating this 73 block area. In fact, in an editorial, Mayor Bloomberger, Bloomberg, <laughs> Bloomberg uh, said that he expected only a few would result from this um, re up, up zoning. So the question then is why the rush? And another question for me, more importantly, is why can't we then, if this is, what's the big deal? So if only a few buildings are going to result from this upzoning, why do we have to rezone 73 blocks? And might we instead um, take a breath and really think about this more as an opportunity? And the reason why it's kind of important to not just uh, kind of dismiss this and say, oh, well, only a few buildings will result, so what's the big deal, is that the new development is as of right. And that is a big deal, because what that really means is that if the developers' uh, plans conform to the zoning, or if they acquire the air rights, or if they contribute to the building improvement fund to contribute to the public realm, or to con uh, contribute to 
um, improvements of the subway systems and so forth, then, then as of right they can build these buildings. With the big exception of buildings that um, want to exceed even that uh, level of uh, upzoning, and then there's the you know the usual sort of uh, urban land uh, review process, and in that case the developers, the owners, will need to kind of make a case that they're actually contributing to the skyline, they're adding to the public realm, they're bringing some other uh, amenity or aspect, they're contributing to the quality of the city, and they therefore should be granted this additional bonus of going up to 30 FAR. Well, my position is, why isn't that a requirement for all buildings? So, um, with these questions uh, kind of milling in my mind, it suddenly occurred to me as I was preparing for this talk that about seven or eight years ago, I actually conducted a studio here, and it was called Park Avenue Redux. And uh, it was partially prompted by this kind of observation that uh, when you get off a plane from Shanghai or from other parts of Asia and the Middle East, there is this sense in a certain way that New York is almost medieval in comparison. And so what might be a kind of future vision for Park Avenue, given that Park Avenue really instigated this typology and this idea of the kind of uh, skyscraper central business district. And the students um, really took this on. And it's interesting that the areas that they were intrigued with kind of don't appear anywhere in the discussions that are going on. The students were questioning why is the zoning, the little colors on the map, you know, blue, orange, and yellow, and residential, commercial, hotel, why are we so um, strict and stringent with typology? Are we already limiting the possibilities for this site by virtue of the way that we represent um, uh, zoning guidelines? And that brings another question as to why in this day and age when we can represent data with very sophisticated <coughs> software programs, and we have a whole host of experts who are um, able to visualize complex conditions in very visceral ways, do we still fall back on fairly conventional means of representation that hark back to the start of the 20th century? So if one was to sort of step back and then look at issues that perhaps are uh, invisible within these conventional means of representation, we might be asking uh, a whole set of additional questions. And so for me, the qu first question would be, well, where is the vision? Um, part of the problem with the plan as it's put forward is its zoning. For me, it's not really planning. It's not a master plan. It's not a vision. It's not something that's following in the tradition of uh, Central Park or even the desire to establish uh, mass transit going from City Hall up to the hundreds um, in the turn of the century, a project, by the way, that uh, was completed in less than four years, over 100 years ago. And m moreover, how are we determining what are the needs? How are we determining what are the conflicts and the detrimental aspects of the plans? And how are we determining what are acceptable solutions? And so I would um, say that a lot of this kind of decision making kind of falls back on very um, kind of, you use the word blunt. <laughs> and I think that that's probably part of the problem. There is no room for subtlety here. Uh, the master plan, uh, the guidelines call for certain sizes to be the minimum size requirement in order to garner these extra development rights. Minimum 200 feet of frontage, 25,000 foot footprint. So that in and of itself will uh, lead to a certain kind of building being produced. And one has to ask, well, what kind of buildings are not being produced as a result of that? Why do we have 200-foot frontages? Why do we not ask more questions about the nature of public space? Um, one of the contradictory, uh, in, in the as of right uh, plaza bonuses, for instance, um, except for Park Avenue, which is kind of an exceptional condition, uh, there's an as of right bonus for six square feet per square foot of plaza that's provided as long as it doesn't increase the FIR by 1.0. However, it cannot be used if there's a requirement for continuous street frontage or continuous retail space. These kind of either or black and white conditions seem to me counterproductive to creating a vital urban environment where experts and professionals can bring their creativity and innovation to the fore. 
Another area where I would say that the status quo is limiting, uh, uh, focus on the status quo is limiting us is in the area of transportation. We're talking about the subway and we're talking about ground transportation, bus service and so on, but nobody seems to be talking about what will be mobility in the future, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 60 years from now. At the uh, last auto show, the president of uh, Mercedes-Benz arrived at the show uh, driving a car. Well, not quite. The car was driving itself, and the president got out of the back seat, and there was nobody sitting in the front seat. And his opinion is that we will have driverless cars within 10 to 15 years from now. So these kinds of visionary projects might not be so visionary before we know it. What about thinking about using uh, the waterfront, about ferry transportation, how might that begin to kind of impact our reliance on the subway? Why can't we rethink the yellow cab? Do we need really cabs that size when most passengers are single individuals? Um, who are our new workers? Who are the people that are living in the city? Since the 1980s, the demographics of the city have changed radically. There is a greater attraction for families to remain in the city. That means that their use of urban space has changed. Where is the acknowledgement of that besides kind of just adding streets and um, benches along uh, the sidewalks? Might we rethink more how these buildings are used at night rather than, again, kind of creating central business district ghettos? Um, another kind of point of, of contradiction uh, within the plan, for instance, is the Environmental impact um, determined that a lot of the congestion could be relieved, um, might, might be questionable, but for instance, they say if, uh, the, if uh, there's no street furniture, then there will be uh, relieved congestion along the sidewalk. So this kind of strange counterproductive kind of uh, uh, quantitative thinking, I think is very much to the detriment of the development of the city in the future, and I really think that it would be advantageous to take up the um, opportunity by having a 2017, 2017 sort of moratorium on future development to stand back, to really think about what this city will be, not just in 10 years, not in 20 years, but perhaps 50 years and 100 years. Thank you. Thank you, Vicente. You really uh, gave us a lot of food for thought in terms of questioning and rethinking the proposal. Um, our final presenter is going to be Michael Kimmelman. He's going to give an overall response to some of the presenters and I guess um, some of his own thoughts about the proposal. Sure. Um. Thanks. Um, so they covered a, a whole lot of different um, approaches, and I, I just will rather randomly try to respond to some. Uh, I wrote about this myself and uh, not so very long ago, so some of the things that came up in looking at this um, um, proposal obviously came up this, in these discussions, and I'll try to touch on a few again. I, uh, I, I don't, I, and I think the conversation did um, reveal this. I, I don't think the dichotomy actually, and you did try to sort of qualify, but I don't think it's such a sharp dichotomy between business friendly and tradition. Heritage, obviously, I think the overwhelming majority of people, including people who uh, are interested in um, landmark preservation, understand the idea that development is okay. And this area is an area I, I came across very few people who don't think some kind of development in, in um, East Midtown is, is okay. So I think. The, the resistance to it um, has a lot to do with some of the issues that came up, which is that the plan is um, totally ass backwards. I mean, it's come up uh, because the Bloomberg administration, let's repeat it and make it clear, is, is running out of time and wanted to pass this large rezoning for 73 blocks before the administration was finished. And before, I think, uh, the kinds of considerations which we've just begun, Lisa and Spring up and Kate brought up and Andrew brought up as well, um, and David too, uh, were really considered. And these are um, public realm considerations, infrastructural considerations, and some of the more profound ones that I think Lisa touched on at the end. You know, 
uh, th this came up in the discussion as well, and I, I want to return to it. New generations of people are moving into cities. What, what are they moving? What, what, what makes New York appealing? I think to large numbers of people who are moving here, the appeal of New York has to do with its pedestrian-friendly streets, with its neighborhoods, with the fact that these are not sort of office ghettos. Um, so Google moves into Chelsea because Google's employees want to work in an area that has historic buildings where their employees feel at home, which is close to them by transit. Um, they're not necessarily looking for these 200-foot, uh, you know, giant office towers that are out of uh, Mad Men. Obviously, there are, there are people who are looking for those buildings, and there's a percentage of people, um, percentage of companies, global companies, that will want the kind of buildings that, that, uh, that East Midtown envisions, and we should, in New York City, be able to compete for them. But I do think we, we have to, and Uthan brought this up at the end, I do think we have to begin to really envision the city in the future and to say, you know, it, possibly this neighborhood um, needs to be much more subtly considered. To begin by saying what are our priorities in the public realm, what are our infrastructural needs, what are the kind of transit needs. You know, Barclays came up, but I think I would say, David, that the, the illustration of Barclays, which is really fascinating to me, in which you have virtually no parking, if I'm not correct, um, was successful precisely because of the enormous amount, the capacity of, of public transit there, sitting atop this, you know, the network of subway lines. What we have in East Midtown is, of course, an incredibly burdened um, uh, East Side subway system. And so I, I would say that it is true that we can't necessarily anticipate all of the needs and the ways in which people will adapt and the extent to which they'll use maybe driverless cars or bicycles or, or whatever. But I think it's a fair thing to say that if East Midtown does develop in some way that the city would wish it to, that is to say with more people using this neighborhood, then it could, would inevitably, we would hope, add more traffic to some sort of form of mass transit because we wouldn't want more people driving into the neighborhood. Um, and so I, I just would say that I, at the very least I agree with you guys that we would have to begin by saying what are the improvements we need and how can we get them before we worry about um, freeing up 70 blocks for some sunrise clause in which buildings might be developed in some number of years. I mean, the whole thing is, is, is just, uh, I, I think, quite clearly not a fully thought out plan. And the fact that we have made exceptions, like with the Foster Building, which I think is a very good exception, suggests to me that we can continue to do that before we have to make some large rezoning uh, decision, which is, you know, um, as everyone has been saying, a, a very blunt instrument for change. We need planning throughout the city and, um, and not just in this area, but I think a, a kind of large, um, and, and this is the task perhaps of the next mayor, to undertake real planning um, and to make that a priority for, for the next few years. Um, and, and, you know, the last thing I'll say to get back to the landmarks issue, I mean, it's a signal of how badly this has been handled so far that we have not really, that the landmark decisions have been put off um, so as to allow the process to go forward uh, through city planning and then to the city council where I think it still remains. And so city council can, uh, it does have the option, though it rarely does this when city planning has approved things, it has the option to send it back to the drawing board, which I think would be a good idea. Um, all these landmark decisions were delayed. We should be suspicious of this. It's, it's absolutely absurd. Uh, as Andrew was saying, that anyone would suggest in this rich historic area that we would not have buildings that we need to um, landmark. And lastly, I would just agree with Lizanne. Obviously, this issue of um, as of right is very important because if we accept the idea that the only way we can get the kind of public realm and infrastructural improvements we need in this area is somehow by this trickle-down philosophy that the buildings um, will somehow contribute to this fund, and yet we say that very few buildings are actually going to get built, then this is a kind, you know, this is kind of mumbo jumbo. I mean, either there are, is there going to be enough development in this area to fund the kinds of changes we really need, 
or we're not really going to get those changes ever, which in any case are going to be delayed years from now by the very process of the sunrise clause and the fact that these buildings will take so many years to develop. So I think we need to be very clear. We, we should, I think, set, have a clear plan for the kinds of public realm improvements and infrastructural improvements we want. We should then begin to say, you know, what kind of neighborhood should this be? And do that as I think Lizanne and Kate have talked about as well, to think about that in the future in relation to other neighborhoods and changing demands of new generations. And then we have the capacity to make changes on a building by building basis without having to rezone uh, 73 blocks. And also to do the kinds of planning which for all the good that this administration has done, I think has not always been its, its highest priority. So that's as best I can do, thanks. Okay, at this point I'm gonna ask the panelists to uh, come up to the front. Um, we'll have, start sort of a dialogue amongst ourselves and I would invite some of you who may have questions and comments to also stick around and hopefully uh, we have, I think we're doing well as far as time, so we should have uh, time for a rich question <laughs> and answering session. Uh, don't freeze up here. <laughs> so I think that was a, a good um, balance of perspectives, um, maybe a little light on the pro yes, <laughs> uh, <you're telling> me. <laughs> rezoning side, but maybe maybe perhaps that's deserved uh, given the... Uh, the well, yeah. Could I just say one thing, I won't monopolize this, but, but this gets to that point that maybe this was light on the pro rezoning side, but it wasn't necessarily light on the idea that this neighborhood could be developed and take and accommodate new buildings and be open to commercial development. I mean, I think, I don't think anybody here actually suggested that somehow this is a, this needs to be preserved in amber. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point, Michael. And, and, and one thing I would follow up, I think you alluded to this and also, um, also Lisanne and um, perhaps Andrew even more so, and, this, and that's the notion of, um, you know, what vision do we have for the neighborhood? Um, you know, I think it is clear that perhaps the rezoning was not a well, it's certainly not a comprehensive plan um, for that area and perhaps was not thought through as well as it could have been. Uh, but what, you know, I, to me, one question I had about it, and I'm, I'd be curious to hear what some of your reactions are in terms of, you know, the argument that the city puts forth in part to support this, um, is that the type of city we want? It's, and is there a contradiction in what they're putting forward? So part of their argument seems to be that, you know, to maintain New York City um, as, a, as a dynamic place that attracts talent from around the world, we need to have this rezoning of Park Avenue. And you know, I think you mentioned Google moving here and, and moving to lower Manhattan. And certainly I think you know, people who are familiar with economic development or even innovation would question whether or not those folks would, that do come here, would they likely to end up on Park Avenue? And to the extent that we really do want to maintain New York as a, a, a vibrant and dynamic place that draws young people around, is this the part of the city that we need to focus on? So I, I'd be curious to hear some of your reactions to that. Since there's so little pro going on, can I just start sure. by rebutting some of that? I mean, first of all, you want a city to have lots of different types of real estate stock that suit lots of different types of businesses, lots of different types of companies, and arguably you want areas of the city that are more sort of 24 seven and, and I'm surprised nobody brought up the fact that this is really about a commercial district and should we even be thinking about residential, which is really the way we're thinking about all our new developments now of mixed use developments. Um, but the other thing I, I, I guess I wanna say is the sense that we can plan and develop East Midtown. We can all sit back and then over a five year period of time or a slower period of time, decide what it's gonna look like and then make it happen is to me in total contradiction with the way New York City has evolved. We have planned parts of the city. We planned the grid in 1811. We basically blew up all of the, what I think would have been the really fabulous parts of New York, the valleys, the hills, the everything else to create the grid system for real estate reasons and allowed New York City's development to march ahead, arguably that made it 
the, the commercial powerhouse it is today. But, but really, the real estate market deliberately is not a government market. It's not something that you plan in a developed area where you have a lot of existing interest. It is suitable for planning when you have a, an, an area of land like Hudson Yards or Atlantic Yards, where you have a big swath of land that needs infrastructure, that needs careful thought, where you can almost start from scratch. We're not starting from scratch here. We have existing tenants, we have existing needs, we have industries that very much depend on being close to transit. The other point I'd really like to make, which is something that's very personal to me, but I'd be interested um, to see how the audience feels about it is, you know, I question, not this proposal, I actually think this proposal is, is fine and is one step in the right direction. I think some of the mechanisms of finance, the infrastructure, have to be worked out, including the timing. But I question why we're not thinking about other areas of the city particularly the area around Penn Station and development there, for areas that equally need attention and focus and that this administration, for whatever reason, has not chosen to focus on, that can really manage density even, even more than this area can. So those are just some comments to stimulate further thought. Any reactions to uh... um, Well, I don't disagree that uh, Madison Square Gardens and that whole area requires another look and maybe it's a higher in fact a higher priority than Manhattan Midtown East because in some respects it already works pretty well it it could perhaps be better as opposed to Madison Square Garden but um, I have a couple of few points I'd just like to react to one is when you said that this is a commercial district well so is a financial district and now it's mostly a residential district so I mean I I wonder at what point we stop and kind of question what the status quo is I mean I think that we need to ask ourselves why are we kind of um, uh, straightjacking ourselves into this kind of uh, use and uh, kind of not looking at alternatives for that. And the other issue that um, Michael brought up was the issue of the public realm. And I find it strange that we lump above and below ground in the same category. Because I think the problem of having additional mezzanine space in Grand Central Station and a wider stairways coming out of the subway is one set of problems. But having um, an environmentally attractive uh, urban realm at street level is a different problem. And they're not unrelated. And although I could sort of, you know, I can see how technically we can solve some of the things in Grand Central Station, the problem with above ground is that you can't widen those sidewalks unless you take on traffic. Because the buildings, if you know, only a few buildings get redeveloped, their building line isn't moving. So what are the strategies to begin to improve the, the, the street level? And lastly, I think um, the example of Google is kind of interesting. And it's not so much only that they require a different kind of workspace and you know they have another way of kind of uh, uh, of interacting as a business and so on but it's uh, going back to the issue of demographics that's an industry that doesn't work Monday to Friday 9 to 5 and so the question is again like are we still kind of assuming that the same industries are going to return to Midtown East even if new real estate is made available or can we perhaps envision other kinds of occupancies Go ahead. No, I, was just gonna, um, I, I wanted to ask, by the way, this, this idea of mixed use is, of course, really interesting. I, I bow to everybody here who knows more about this, but it's my assumption that many developers would love to be able to convert office buildings now into uh, residential because this is where all the money is. I mean, you mentioned development in London near Tower Bridge, so the Shard by Piano, you know, has this, as a hotel, it has a offices and it's got a few apartments, 10 of them, and then some restaurants and then the viewing tower. And those 10 apartments alone pay for the entire project if the Qataris wanted to bother to actually sell them, but they're so expensive that they just figure they'll keep them and the prices will go up. So I say this because, I mean, I wonder if the issue, in fact, in neighborhoods like this and in others isn't, and really I ask it as a question, isn't protecting, to a certain extent, commercial, um, uh, properties. Um, I, I think actually, for what it's worth, that the city is going to develop with multiple nodes in, in all over, in Brooklyn and possibly Jamaica and so forth. And so the, the focus on Manhattan, and particularly on Midtown Manhattan, 
is a very parochial one which will seem quite dated. I'm not saying that there's not going to be a use to this, but I think it's going to seem uh, very uh, parochial over a period of time. And, and some of the appeal of these other places will be, uh, say, the watchtower buildings in Brooklyn. So protecting those from becoming um, residential, which would be obviously incredibly lucrative to the developer, um, but providing some means to make them commercial seems to me a challenge in the future. I, I, I know I've gotten off track, but it's just in thinking about East Midtown, one of the questions would be how much actually should it remain commercial when the pressures will be to make it that much more residential. Well, Kate, um, the real estate's not my area of expertise by far. So I was, my understanding was that one of the impetuses um, stated by the mayor was that he wanted to discourage um, making some of those older buildings or allowing them to become residential because it would impact negatively the tax base. Even though it's profitable to the developers, but the tax base would suffer as a result. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody well, I, 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 you know, I didn't read that specifically, but the idea is to keep it a very strong commercial district. And to do that, you need certain kinds of property, and the properties there clearly aren't meeting the need, or certain of them. So the idea is that those soft sites or those, you know, vulnerable areas could actually become the state-of-the-art buildings that support the commercial district more broadly, and of course, the, the tax base as well. Right. I mean, I think it's also the case that uh, commercial tax on a per square, uh, commercial properties on a per square foot basis generate more taxes than right. residential, right? So uh, from the city's perspective, commercial real estate uh, will generate more tax revenue uh, aside from, you know, what other most might be driving it. Um, and then we, we, I wanna open it up to the audience for questions as well. I just have one, um, one other question, and this is in terms of the mayor's motive. So I think, you know, we get kind of a, uh, several of you have said, well, you know, the mayor wanted to leave behind a legacy of, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what he had in mind, um, you know, assuming the rezoning did go through, um, do you suspect it would have a significant impact? Uh, some of you said oh, probably not. Um, you know, this is the economic uncertainty. Uh, you know, what types of businesses do want to come to New York? The ones that do want to come, do they want to come here? Um, so can you, can you get inside the, mayor, the mayor's mind a little bit more, perhaps? Um, what exactly does he have in mind? Is he just said, well, let's just, I have a couple of days left, uh, you know, sure, let's rezone, or is, is he really anticipating a legacy that he could be proud of, uh, or is it, are his real estate cronies really happy about this, or uh, what's, going, what's going on here? I think I'm feeling put on the spot. Well, I, I, you know, I think Michael writes beautiful prose, and I think it's, it's you know, a, a great story that a mayor wants to give his friends, you know, something when he leaves. Um, the, the, the truth is probably, and I don't know because I wasn't there at the onset, that, you know, city planning has a lot of things they wanted to do. This has been a very activist city planning administration, rather three administrations, and if left to their own devices, there would probably be a whole series of other things that they wanted to do as well, which they would also push through with, um, with equal vigor. So I think there is a genuine sense that there were problems on the east side, that the commercial district is important to retain um, over the, you know, over the future, and that there are some tools that they are really heady about using. And I think this value capture idea that started very slowly with individual buildings, got expanded in huts and yards, is something that people found, oh, we can, we can find money this way, so here's a way that we can do it to solve some problems over here. I really don't you know, ascribe any more sinister motives. Um, the question of picking that over other things that they might have done, the speed with which it was done, and you know, the landmarks issue, which Andrew brought up about not landmarking other buildings, um, are, are all really good questions. But personally, I, I, I don't think it's as simple as a, a gift to some real yeah, estate. I mean, to, be, to defend myself, I, I actually have never said such a thing. I mean, and I don't think so. I actually don't think you know, Bloomberg has behave that way at all. I don't, I don't think his interests are all in paying off cronies. I, mean, I, never, I never have thought that. I think he, I think he believes that every, in everything that he's doing, and he thinks that it's good for the city. And um, you know, I don't think this is an evil plan. I think it's a half-baked plan. That, that's what I said. And I think it wasn't as well considered and it tended to be. Uh, it has the quality of being a little rushed by, by my lights um, compared to the, some of the other plans. 
I mean, I know that there's talk out there about people who just think it's a payoff to develop it. I don't think he thinks that way. And anyway, it's meaningless. That's not really the, the question. So, I, th I think the legacies that um, Bloomberg has, Mayor Bloomberg has left have a lot to do with the improved quality of life for a lot of New Yorkers. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm not against development in that area. I'm not against tall buildings. I, if they stick out of the skyline, it's fine with me. And I think that if, you know, through his um, tenure, there are some spectacular buildings that get approved and get built and kind of are outside of the current zoning, which is to a certain extent ridiculous right now where it's, you know, 1963 was made less than it was previously. I mean, definitely there are problems. But I think he's, you know, he's trying to, um, the, 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 the gesture is just too much for what really needs to be done, as, you know, in the near future. Also, I think if, if you look back at the 12 years of a very activist mayor involved with, with planning and building issues, I think one of the, the problems that has arisen time after time is that an idea has come forth and the, the, the background work isn't done. So the mayor suggested congestion pricing so that people would have to pay to get into Manhattan, which as a friend of mine calls a no-brainer. And I think that probably for a lot of people in this room, that's true. But there was no preparation in the areas of Eastern Queens and, and Southern Brooklyn where mass transit is really terrible. Uh, and so people do want to commute in by car to, to improve the mass transit so people wouldn't want it to. And I think that this has happened time after time, that the, 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 the background infrastructure isn't set. And I think that that's a, one of the big problems here as well. A plan is put forth and there's no I hate to use the word, but a plan is put forth and there's no planning for it uh, to, to make it really work. And, and I think you can analyze a lot of the, the, the things that have happened in the last 12 years uh, and find that that has been a problem um, over and over again. Okay, I have plenty of other questions, but I want to give uh, audience members an opportunity to um, pose any questions or possibly comments that you might have. Uh, we have um, we have a microphone, and, um, so if you could, I guess, pass the mic over. You gonna? Is that how we're gonna do it? Yeah, two. have two microphones. Okay. Sure. Uh, first, a comment that I find this uh, rezoning remarkably uncontroversial. I mean, at, at its most basic level, it's it's just an increase in density in, in Midtown, and this is Midtown Manhattan. And if we're afraid of density, um, then we're in the wrong place. I think. Um, but I guess ultimately, I think there are legitimate concerns about you know the, the, the timing and and the process and all. But we are kind of where we are in the process that this rezoning is about to be approved. Uh, so I guess my question to to the panel is, if if the five of you were the city council, and this is the proposal before you today, uh, how how do you vote the way it is now? And I, I suspect that we have an idea, but it'll be interesting to see kind of kind of where you come down on it. Well, obviously, I would vote no, but I would also like to say that I don't think it's a fait accompli that this is going to be passed, especially now in F, F, with a new mayoral uh, election coming up. And, and the fact that the city council, uh, the, the, the head of city council is no longer, I think, as powerful as she once was. So I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't think it's a fait accompli. I would vote no. I just think that the... There's a need for infrastructure to be in place to accommodate increased density and that there's no guarantee that this will generate the funds to accomplish that. And in the meantime, I think some developments can go forward with the urban land review process that exists already. Like the Foster building that's yeah. up there. Yeah. I mean, obviously I agree exactly with that and I would just qualify what you said, which is you set up a question as if there are people who oppose density in this area and I, I don't hear anybody saying that. I don't think that's what it's about. As you said, I think there are other issues. So. But I would vote no, obviously, for the same reasons we've just said. Why don't you finish and then I'll vote yes. <laughs> Quite honestly, I would probably support this. Um, I think well, there's a number of things that have come up that uh, suggest to me that we're just sort of dancing around the key issues. Some of the big issues are we're constrained by the 1961 zoning code 
we need to do more to make more desirable development as of right. This is a real problem for the growth of the city. And we need to, and because we are unable politically, I'm not blaming anyone specifically, but we're unable politically to revisit the entire zoning code so we could actually plan the city, so we could have a citywide discussion, a regional discussion even, about how should the city and the region develop. Because we're unable to do that, we're left with these piecemeal um, spot zones, which is what this is. And I want to make a point about the commercial property and how critical it is to have these commercial districts. It's not just that commercial property generates more tax revenue. They demand fewer services. And that's really important. All these people who are moving into Manhattan, they are demanding a lot of services, which is really straining the city's budget. They want schools, they want police, they want fire, they want all these things that people want in these nice cities. And, but, but, you know, if, but if, you're, if you're an office building, you're not demanding nearly all of that. And so, it, so we have to, you have to balance the, the need for this commercial development with, um, you know, with what's being demanded. And the, you know, we can like it or not like it, but it's all mixed together and a lot of the problems that we're dealing with with land development in the city, get back to the fact we, we, we will not revisit the 1961 code in, in full. And so we're left with these, these spot zonings, which are really problematic for all these reasons. I mean, if we were having this conversation about Jamaica, Queens, we'd, we'd be able to come up with many of the same issues. If we were talking about redevelopment in any of the boroughs other than Manhattan, we'd have very, very serious concerns about the transportation system. Yeah. Here we have serious concerns, but not very, very serious concerns. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot uh, going on, not just with this, but th we can look at the Midtown East rezoning as a symptom of many of the problems that we have with actually planning the city. Before, Kate, before you do, can I just say one tiny thing just to raise it, because sure. we didn't just emphasize this here. I, 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 I'm with you on all of that thing, but this has this sunrise Clause. So if the urgency to do this is so great, and this is something that's got to be done, then can we just say, do we want to approve this plan or not approve it with the Sunrise Clause, which is there for some reason that I, we can only take to mean so as not to compete with, with Midtown, with the, the West Side, the Hudson Yards, and with Downtown. And it, that, to me, is an inherent problem with the plan, that if there's an urgency to do it, do it. If it's, if it's not that urgent, then why sign this into law now for something that we're gonna have happen four years from now? So I'm sorry, I just wanted to raise this as a question. Uh, you know, I, I guess I'm sort of with the fellow in the back row, which is I'm not sure I understand what the big deal is. Um, yeah, I, I understand your point, which is what's the rush if it's not gonna take effect and have any input, either because there's not a lot of sites or because it's not gonna happen right away. I guess the other side is, is it really hurting anything? I mean, what in, in answer to the question about how I would vote if I were in the city council, what usually happens at the city council and in the run-up to the city uh, planning commission vote is there's a lot of backroom dealing, and I'm sure there's been a lot of backroom dealing. And the only issue for me, other than the fact that there's lots of parts of the city that should have been addressed during this administration and haven't, is the mechanism is whether the infrastructure improvements really will get built, and that's what we really need. And we really need to have them in place before any of this materializes. And you know, they managed to come up with a variety of mechanisms in other places to ensure that the infrastructure came first, including the building out of the entire you know, west side of Manhattan when the subways went up you know, into rural areas and brought the development. And so long as those concerns are addressed, and I think they are being addressed in terms of a mechanism, to ensure that certain absolutely necessary improvements are put in place before any of this development happens, I really don't see the harm. I really don't. I wonder if, uh, I, I know I promised I wouldn't ask any more questions, but I was just curious if, if the financing mechanism, financing mechanism is that um, really a, sort of a rational way to allocate funds, right? So it's because you're kind of tying the city's, if, you know, to the extent that you tie the funds to these particular improvements that makes some sense right because it's, it's it's financing it but at the same time you're sort of the city's sort of tying its hands um, and you know you can imagine there could be more pressing needs for the revenue so I wonder I don't know if that there's an easy answer to that question there, um, there's not an easy answer but 
We have to keep in mind that it's really, really, really unbelievably expensive to build new transit infrastructure in New York. And so if we're going, to, if we're talking about building new infrastructure, we're talking about adding billions to the cost of whatever is being developed. And that dramatically affects the cost-benefit analysis of any of these projects. And I don't know, even at, two, I think the current, the current rate in the proposal is 250 bucks a square foot for air rights, which would then go in. And I don't know what is a realistic um, figure for how much money would eventually be raised, but it's not going to be enough to build subway lines that will serve the additional people. That's just, there's not enough money to do that. And there are, and we do, we have to focus on ways to improve the transport system that don't cost a ton of money. But in the context, if we are going to raise money, and, I, and the reason I mentioned the West Side and, and the Penn Station proposals is, you know, if we're talking about raising billions of dollars from a specific area, we have to have a collective discussion about where should we be spending those billions of dollars. If there's billions of dollars of non-distortionary tax income sitting in the city somewhere, where should we spend it? And it may or may not be in these locations. And I'm not saying that it is, I'm not saying that it isn't. But you know, is this, are these the types, of, the types of mechanisms that we should really be looking at for the outer boroughs? Should we be looking at them elsewhere? And as a, as a general rule, I support value capture, but it is subject to a lot of um, political dealings that may reduce its public, um, public benefit. I guess I should just add, just as a, a piece of insight, so um, before I, I came here, I was actually in the real estate industry, and one of the last um, deals that I was involved in was right as the market was crashing, I guess, was to take down another historic building, the Hotel Pennsylvania, um, which is opposite Penn Station, um, and put up a very large Class A office building, a corporate headquarters building in a place where there's a lot of mass transit. And at that time, there was a very generous subway bonus offered. It was, you know, about 20% of the floor area in return for reopening the Gimbel's Passageway that connected 7th Avenue and 6th Avenue, in part to alleviate the tremendous congestion, east-west congestion moving to and from Penn Station. It was very, very, very complicated to negotiate. The price that the, the developer ended up offering to pay was roughly about $200 a square foot, something like that, um, to an improvement that cost maybe about $80 million, something like that. So just compare $80 million to the types of money we're talking about for some of the big improvements on the east side. But notwithstanding that, even though the permits were issued, the market is not strong enough at that point because it turned down to support the development. So these things, too, move in cycles. At various points, you'll have developers interested in, in, in moving ahead with the kind of Class A office space we know on the east side and on the west side. But, but that window is so small. And if that development process is belabored because of all the other um, complicated things that have to happen to, to, to line up you know, everybody's ducks, it just won't happen. So anything that can make that process easier helps to ensure that we get the kind of um, new office stock to blend with the Class B and Class C office buildings. But it isn't easy. Other, any other questions? Um, I was wondering why we see things like massive scale zoning. I mean, this is 79 blocks. Um, why do we see things like this be put in front of councils before we see things as suggested master plans for districts? You mean a community board master plan? Uh, yeah, essentially that. Um, I mean, we're talking about how this requires a lot of transit development as well as green space and... I guess um, the, the best way to answer that is it's, is, is it's an artifact of the way we plan. Uh, the, we've talked about zoning as being a blunt tool, but it's the only tool we have. So, I mean, the master plans and the, you know, those types of plans are nice, but they don't, they don't have the legal weight that the zoning code has. So it's the zoning that has to be changed. And the zoning has to be changed through these specific processes. So I keep hearing that um, the zoning itself is a blunt tool that, that I guess it's impacting all these projects. And one of the questions that kind of came to me was, 
um, especially with this historic pr preservation perspective, is why are we? Why is there an argument that we should be using zoning as a historic preservation tool, as a way to stem development? And why aren't we addressing the historic preservation of these buildings separately through historic preservation methods instead of trying to keep a down zoning on these areas? Well, I, I, um, I'm not sure that what you're saying is correct. I think that the preservation community has responded to the fact that this zoning proposal doesn't mention the word preservation anywhere. Uh, and and it's, not trying, it's not saying, well, we should down zone to protect the building. It's, just, it's only saying that there are significant buildings here that should be part of the plan to look at what deserves preservation as part of the overall proposal. The preservationists aren't, aren't taking a stand on, on the, the, zoning, uh, the, the zoning level. They're only saying that preservation should be part of the discussion when you, when you come up with a really serious plan and that that, is, that that has been ignored here to the point of this report, which is a very lengthy report that says everything is worthless in this area that has not already been designated and therefore preservationists go away. I have a question and a comment. Um, the comment is that the city predicts that it will be 5% growth in the district um, over the next 20 years. I would imagine that if that was your stock portfolio, you'd be very upset with that amount of growth. So that's the comment. The question is that the MTA has predicted that they need $500 million in improvements um, as of tomorrow. And without the rezoning, they do not have that um, allocated in their five-year capital plan. So if the option was no infrastructure improvements or the zoning plan, which one would you see fit? And um, with regards to the dip pricing, would you rather see a flat fee of 250 or would you rather see it uh, spot zoned as of, you know, the price on 42nd and Lexington is different than the price on 57th and Madison? Well, I mean, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure the question that you're asking. Um, are you asking about the mechanism, the zoning mechanism, or is there something better? I'm, I'm, I just want to understand the question. Well, the DIB as of right now is 250 yep. per square foot for the whole district. Right. So th there's been complaints that at 42nd and Lexington, the price should be 500, while at Madison and 50th, it should be $100, and it might, you know, limit the amount of growth throughout the district. And it's sort of unfair. So I was wondering if you'd rather have site uh, appraisals at the time of the dip purchase or at another point. You know, I just just have to say, having been in real estate and having been in government, you know, I think at some point you just try to facilitate these sorts of transactions. I mean, that's essentially the, the zoning code does try to do that. And I think if you assume that each time, you know, a building comes up and there's going to be an argy bargy about what it's worth and you know, you're basically going to ensure that development gets stalled just because of the complexity and the various interests that get involved and, and, and politicians and politics, unfortunately. So, you know, my preference would be to have something that, again, is blunt and may not represent all of the, um, you know, singular characteristics of individual sites. Now, whether the 73 blocks is the right box around it, no idea how they came up with it. Hi, you guys have mentioned a couple times about how transit infrastructure, you really want, you want to get your infrastructure in before the density. And I was kind of wondering, I mean, I don't think that's an illegitimate um, point, but do you see the status quo changing? Do you see the infrastructure going in if you don't rezone it? I mean, when you go into transit planning committees, they're always talking about, do you see the need? Do you see the demand? If there is no demand, do you see the infrastructure coming in, the market pushing at it? Well, my understanding is that there isn't the money for it unless this development goes forward and that the money will be put in in anticipation of the development going forward. That's my understanding. Isn't that what you were saying, that there is already $500 million earmarked? I but mean, that, I don't know how official that is, but... But that's not for much in the way of expansion. 
That's for remediating so, uh, what's there now. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the idea of building a new subway line is. No, I don't is, think anybody's talking it. about that. I think it's just about, yeah. But there's, a, there's, there's, there are things that can be done with operations throughout yeah. the MTA system that can, can be done independent of any type of rezoning. Um, but, uh, but here, the amount that would be raised is not enough to make a meaningful dent or a meaningful increase in the size of the system. It, it might Im help improve the way the system operates some. Just, just another thing to think about when you think of, and, and you know, David's really the expert, but in terms of transportation infrastructure, remember it's not um, a singular node. Part of the reason that Grand Central operates the way it operates and Penn Station operates the way it operates is because of um, because people are feeding in from other places. Where those trains go, how many of those trains there are, um, really affects how many people and are out on the pavement at any particular moment in time. And because trains go other places, some planes that come into Grand Central can go to Penn Station, some trains from Penn Station can go to other places. Um, part of it is looking at it systemically and thinking about the growth not only in the city but in the areas around it, and that's not just you know, that's not just the five boroughs and it's not just New York State, and understanding how that system is gonna evolve and what kind of capacity should be provided at those transit nodes for commuters, for subway riders, for long distance travelers, including Amtrak passengers coming from Philadelphia or Boston. So it really is part of a much bigger picture and the funding questions are, are you know, gargantuan. They're very, very significant and what we're talking about at Grand Central is just one piece of that bigger picture. That was one thing you said, David, that I wanted to follow up on. You said transportation may behave as a gas or a liquid. Are we totally <laughs> ignorant as to, as it could be a solid? No, I guess not. <laughs> but Sometimes are we totally ignorant as to what might precipitate it it's, uh, behaving one way or the other? Well, uh, the, the, the transit that is at capacity will become even uh, more at capacity if everybody behaves as they've behaved in the past. But you know, driverless cars were brought up. Um, the changing relationship with work was brought up. And this is a key issue. Where, you know, the, the, the firms that are locating in these high rent business districts are not locating the entire firm. They're fragmenting. They're locating their, 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 their high level executive and their creative departments. All other aspects of the firm, the back office and everything else, are being farmed out elsewhere. So you're not going to have a firm that comes in and plops down 5,000 employees. You're going to have a firm that comes in and drops down a few hundred. And of those employees, they take up much less space than they used to. And they're not working a 9 to 5 or an 8 to 5 job. You know, uh, 20 years ago, and for a long time, I, I use this in my teaching, we've always considered uh, an employee uses about 300 square feet of office space. If you're planning an office building, you plan for about 300 square feet per employee. And we expect that that's going to drop down to about 75 square feet of space per employee. Right? And so we, and those employees are not necessarily going to be there Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. Um, they're going to come and go, and our relationship with work is changing, our relationship with the city is changing why we're in the city is changing. So these are all things that we can't anticipate. But we do know that there's a period of, we're going through what seems to be a period of change over the last 50 years of urban growth in the US. And it seems that this is changing. And so the constraints that the transport system has will affect the choices that people make about how often they work, where they work. Say we increase um, employment by 20%, in, in this area, but at the same time, we reduce the amount of time people go to the office by 25%, which is plausible. It may not be likely, but it's plausible, in which case we, can, we might be able to handle far more employees who work sometimes in Midtown East, even with the existing system. So, and these are just things that we don't know, and employers are becoming much more involved in transport planning and housing issues than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. If anyone, uh... Okay, we will end on that note. Thank you. Thank you.
Es ist so groß auch gedreht.